In this tutorial, we will render a colored cube using modern OpenGL. This might seem overly simplistic, but actually there is a lot we need to understand before attempting to code this basic example. We need to know how to set up OpenGL buffers, transfer the data to the GPU, and add another vertex attribute for the color. We also need to understand how OpenGL draws triangles, how depth works, and how to properly clear the Z buffer and set up face culling. So if that sounds interesting to you, be sure to like and subscribe, and let's begin. Let's pick up where we left off in the buffers tutorial, but with a few changes. The OpenGL canvas now has its own header and implementation files. We've also switched one of the rotation axes from the Z axis to the Y axis, which works better when viewing the cube from the front. Plus, we are now rendering a simple square instead of a surface. Our square is built from two triangles. The vertices are declared in the XYZ array, and the triangles are defined in the triangle vertex indices array, which we will pass to our element buffer object. If you don't know how this works, be sure to watch my OpenGL buffers tutorial. And here's what the app looks like. Now we need to add more cube faces to our arrays. We want each of them to have a different color, so we need another attribute pointer. We are interleaving the positions and colors of each vertex here. The first three numbers indicate the XYZ position of the first vertex, followed by its red, green and blue color values. The following three numbers specify the position of the next vertex, followed by its respective color. This pattern continues for each subsequent vertex. These changes need to be reflected in the vertex attribute pointers. The stride is now six floats, because that's where the next vertex starts. We also add another attribute for the color, which starts at position 3. For the new attribute to have an effect, it must be used in the shaders. The vertex shader accepts the color at location 1 and passes it to the fragment shader through the output variable. This value is then used to set the color displayed on the screen. And here's our square, correctly colored by the fragment shader. Let's bring our front face forward and add a top square. For now, we will assume that smaller Z values mean the object is closer to the viewer. More on that later. OK, this starts to look more like a cube. Let's add more faces with different colors. And we have a problem. The red front face is no longer visible, and the whole cube looks really confusing when we start rotating it. The Z value is the issue. We assume that the lower Z values mean the object is closer to the viewer, but by default that's not true. When rendering on a flat surface, OpenGL simply draws new triangles over the previously drawn ones without much focus on the Z values, unless we enable something called depth testing. OpenGL can map the Z value of our fragments into something called depth range, which by default is 0 to 1. With depth testing enabled, the depth value of all the fragments or pixels to be drawn is compared to the value stored in a depth buffer and only the ones passing the test are drawn on the screen. The default test is GL less, meaning lower Z values will be chosen over higher Z values. That's why the elements with the lower Z value look closer to the viewer. Let's build a simple settings panel so that we can experiment with the Z buffer more easily. Here's a class to store our settings. We have two possible options for the Z-buffer ordering, a setting to enable depth testing and another one that determines the depth test type. Now the panel with checkboxes and switches to control these settings. We start with the includes and then declare the custom event. It will be used to signal to the canvas that the user changed the settings and the OpenGL context needs to be updated. Next, our custom WX panel subclass. We need the settings member variable and the fields for the checkboxes and the radio buttons. The update boxes function sets the UI state to reflect the settings variable. Note that we disable the radio buttons if the Z buffer checkbox is deselected. If the user doesn't want the Z buffer, it doesn't make sense to let them choose its ordering. The post settings changed event function will be used to notify the event listeners that the user altered the settings. We prepare our custom event and send it using process window event. 
In order to alter the settings, we need to react to the user changing the checkboxes and radio button state. Here we set up callbacks for these controls, where we update the settings variable and send the settings change event. In the constructor, we lay out the checkboxes and choice buttons to mirror our settings object structure. If you are unfamiliar with sizers, be sure to check out my WX widgets layout tutorial. To finish off the settings panel, we provide a setter and a getter for the settings member variable. In the canvas header, we add the settings field and the method to update the OpenGL context with this setting. We also add the settings parameter to the canvas constructor and introduce the getter and the setter. Moving on to the implementation file, the first thing we need to do is to initialize the settings object in the constructor. To use it, however, we need to wait until OpenGL initialization finishes. That's when we call update OpenGL settings. In the methods body, we check the member variables of the settings object and call the relevant OpenGL methods. But that's not all. To decide whether a given fragment should be drawn, OpenGL compares its depth value to the value stored in a depth buffer for given X and Y coordinates. For the depth testing to work correctly, we need to clear the depth buffer before drawing. We do that in the onPaint method. First, we need to determine what value should be used for clearing the buffer. When using GLS as a depth test, we clear the buffer with ones because every possible depth value will be less than one and will pass the test. Well, every value, except when Z equals one, of course. If you really care about these, you would need to use a different test method. The funny thing is that the default depth test is GLS and the default clear value is 1, so if you don't change them and just enable the buffer and clear it, your fragments with the Z of 1 will disappear. But that's a different topic. Let's get back to the code. We set the clear value to 1 for GLS and 0 for GL greater and clear the buffer by adding another flag to the GL clear call. Finally, we need to add the settings panel to the mainframe so it sits to the right of the canvas. This is all the usual stuff. Adding includes adding the panel variable and setting it up in the constructor. Here we set up the communication between the panel and the OpenGL canvas. When we receive an event indicating that the user changed the settings, we update the canvas and refresh it. There is one interesting caveat here. Clicking on the checkboxes on the panel sets the focus on them, allowing them to receive the keyboard events. This means the canvas won't receive the left and right arrow key presses used for rotation until the user clicks on the canvas. We solve this in a way that's similar to what Blender does. We change focus to the canvas when the mouse is over it. Let's see how this works. Finally, our cube looks correct with the Z buffer enabled. Rotations work as expected, and we can toggle the settings to immediately see different configurations. Note that when we switch ordering to greater, the cube is reversed. The direction of the Z axis depends on the depth buffer settings. There is one more setting related to ordering elements along the Z axis, and that's face calling. OpenGL lets us define if the triangle is front-facing or back-facing, and then discard triangles of either type to speed up the renders. Let's add a setting to enable this feature. What we need to do is extend our setting class and add related code to the update OpenGL settings function in our canvas. We have two types of face calling and a bool variable to turn it off and on. The settings panel is easy. We add the checkboxes and the radio buttons along with callbacks and update procedures, just like we did for the depth buffer settings.
In the Update OpenGL Settings function, we configure the face calling feature in OpenGL, paying attention to the setting determining which cube faces should be hidden. We run the app and after enabling face calling and rotating the cube, we can see that something's wrong. The problem is the right face is not visible, so we are able to see inside the cube. The back face is visible and that's another error, it should be discarded. To understand what happened here, we need to talk about the vertex order. Here's a triangle with three vertices, A, B and C. If we enumerate them like this, ABC, BCA or CAB, we are moving to the next vertex in a clockwise direction. This triangle will be categorized by OpenGL as facing back. But if we reverse the order and use any of these three arrangements, then the direction changes to counterclockwise and now our triangle is front-facing. Let's reverse the order of one of the triangles. We change the vertex indices of the second triangle of the back face and run the app. Now one of the triangles of the back face is hidden. We are making progress. Let's do the same with the right face, put the indices in the reverse order. We are able to see a part of the right face. Let's finish the changes and run the app again. After fixing the order, we can see that our cube looks great again. I encourage you to experiment with the settings, trying your own geometric shapes. That, hopefully, will be a great learning experience. Thanks for watching.